A powerful central purpose in one's life is fundamental to fully exuberant living. When Richard Carlson was personnel advisor to the University of Southern California and a management consultant to several large corporations, he reported the result of one searching survey of 10,000 American men and women, which revealed the startling finding that over 90% of those questioned had no definite aim in life. What shall it profit a man if he succeeds in making a living but fails in making a life? wrote Henry David Thoreau, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. In a New England graveyard, there's a tombstone with this epitaph on it. Died at 30, buried at 60. If one does not develop an inner spiritual life, that is precisely what begins to happen. The noblest and the best within you begins to languish and to die. When they used to work mules down in the old coal mines, every Sunday the men would bring the animals up out of the shafts and let them spend a day in the sunlight because they knew that if they didn't, the mules would go blind. Any man or woman, any young person of any age, in industry or daily life who spends seven days a week, month after month, year after year, in the vocational mine shafts, obsessed and compelled by the interests of business or finance or education or work alone, and without taking time for some strolling in the sunlight, for some art, some beauty, for love and friendships, for the incomparable rewards of learning philosophic wisdom, the satisfactions of spiritual values, and above all, the finding and knowing of God. As a father and a friend, not merely finding out about God, but finding God, not merely knowing intellectually about God, but knowing God personally and spiritually, if one does not take time for these things, one becomes blind to these things. No passing moment of your life or mine will ever come to us again. Never again will your heart beat this beat. Never again in the cycles of eternity will you breathe again this breath of air. Be spiritual philosopher enough to know these things and savor them and delight in the moment, each moment of life. For as the ancient Persian king had inscribed upon the ring he wore, I shall not pass this way again. To discover this spiritual dimension of life is thrilling, and if there's any single key to that discovery, it is to begin to permit oneself to flower, begin actualizing the full range of one's human possibilities. This means not only actualizing one's physical potentials by the maintenance of good health. It means not only actualizing one's mental potentials by the maintenance of clear and engaged intellectual processes, not only actualizing one's emotional potentials by cultivating positive feelings toward existence, it furthermore and indeed ultimately means actualizing one's spiritual potentials, achieving a dynamic and progressive spiritual life, a vital philosophy which deals with one's place not only in the family of humankind, but one's significance in the universe itself, addressing the meanings of life and death, the quest for supreme values, truth and beauty and goodness. And what of time and eternity? What of faith and hope? What of love and aesthetics? What of the great systems of thought which have absorbed the thinking of the most perceptive intellects in human history? Can these be casually disregarded by an advanced citizen of the 21st century. Dare any one of us dismiss with a wave of the hand the enduring thinking of a Socrates, a Plato, or Aristotle, the concepts of Spinoza and Kant, of Buddha and Lao Tse, of Moses, Isaiah, and Christ. It was Socrates himself who declared the unexamined life is not worth living. The three most important questions in the entire history of human thought are said to be, where did we come from, why are we here, and where are we going? The architect Buckminster Fuller lamented that the great problem with spaceship Earth was that it did not come with an instruction manual, and neither, others have complained, did its passengers. The human animal has been variously described by philosophers and thinkers as an ingenious assemblage of portable plumbing, the most rational of all the primates, and as a mystic mingling of soil and soul. But whatever one's definition, how you do see yourself and think of yourself is of vast importance. Begin by recognizing your own uniqueness. 
Dr. Murray Bowen of Georgetown University Hospital has done studies which show that in just five generations, a child is a mixture of 64 families. And if you trace your ancestry back 10 generations, you find that you embody the characteristics of 1,024 families and so on. Each one of us is the totally unique result of thousands of years of diverse breeding genetics. And one of the most exciting things you can do is to set about discovering the resultant incredible potentials which yet lie latent within you. There is only one of you in all this universe, and you are that one. And to begin to see your life as a vital, dynamic, spiritual adventure, finding and knowing God and utilizing the full and entire spectrum of your human potentials and possibilities as a son or daughter of God is the beginning of life and life fully abundant. Medical science has learned that no two human fingerprints, no two voice prints, and no two personalities are identical. And this individual uniqueness of each person is something to be celebrated. The poet Robert Frost once wrote, the best things and the best people rise out of their differentness. I'm against an homogenized society because I want the cream to rise. End of quote. To aspire to be the best that you can be, as God created you to be, is a stimulating challenge. Such achievement, needless to say, involves hard work, not mere fantasy and luck. When opportunity knocks at the front door, most people don't hear it because they're out in the backyard looking for four-leaf clovers. But Oliver Cromwell wrote, not only strike while the iron is hot, but make it hot by striking it. One time the San Francisco Chronicle sent out a newspaper reporter to interview some of the people who sit around on the curbs and benches and public squares all day. I'll never forget one man's remark. He told the reporter, I just come here to kill time. And I guess I'll just kill time until it kills me. A dismal philosophy. If you believed that was all there was to life, you'd sit around park benches all day, too. What you believe, in fact, has a tremendous impact on what you do and the way you do it. You have perhaps heard the saying, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. What is even more sobering is the fact that if you don't change directions, you'll end up where you're going. The acts of this moment are the destiny of the future. But what if your ability to act becomes thwarted or impeded? Suppose that in your life you've developed a mental block about something, that no matter how diligently you attack a certain problem or aspect of your existence, you seem incapable of coming up with answers. Dr. Donald Langsley, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California School of Medicine, has made a study of that very problem and has found that the first element of success is to assume that there is an answer to every problem. You block your thought processes by presuming that a certain difficulty is insurmountable. Seek the fresh viewpoint of another wise and experienced individual, Dr. Langsley says. Next, develop a mental picture of doing step by step whatever it is that you have the block about doing. Visualize the situation and visualize yourself as reacting calmly in the midst of it. Another technique is to practice. It has been found that people with serious mental blocks about taking tests necessary for advancement in their work can learn to be good test takers by the simple procedure of taking numerous tests. Sign up for tests simply as practice sessions. Another technique of dealing with a block is to assign the mind to come up with a solution as you drift off to sleep each night. But if all else fails, Dr. Langsley says, pick some one part of the problem and do something about that. And above all, seek spiritual strength and wisdom in daily prayer to God for the meeting and mastering of problems and perplexities. Then act. Simply doing something on a project often has the effect of breaking up the total psychological logjam, blocking the creative thought stream of the mind. The best-selling authoress Edna Ferber once told an interviewer that she could never write a whole novel, but that she could write one paragraph at a time, and that that was how she had written all of her novels. The Chinese have a proverb, he who insists upon deliberating fully before taking a step will spend his entire lifetime standing on one foot.
Benjamin Franklin wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac, the man who does things makes many mistakes, but he never makes the biggest mistake of all, doing nothing. The Creator has given humankind a great deal of good work to be done on this earth, projects not merely to be contemplated, but to be accomplished. And there is an incomparable satisfaction in valiantly plunging into some great task for which you feel a special affinity within the will of God for your life. The British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli declared, men were not designed to be the creatures of circumstances, circumstances are to be the creatures of men. In the year 1868, a New York City newspaper carried this item, quote, a man has been arrested in New York for attempting to extort funds from ignorant and superstitious people by exhibiting a device which he claims will convey the human voice any distance over metallic wires so that it will be heard by the listener at the other end. He calls the instrument a telephone. Well-informed people know that it is impossible to transmit the human voice over wires. End of quote. The most constricting of all human limitations is limited thinking, and the most liberating release from limited thinking is to be found in a dynamic personal faith in the living God. While the pessimist is saying it can't be done and the optimist is saying it can be done, the authentically, spiritually self-actualized individual is saying, I just did it, what's next? When one is confronted by problems, one does well to remember the words of Thomas Jefferson to his daughter. He wrote this in a letter. Trouble, he wrote, is like a knife. If you pick it up by the blade, you will hurt yourself. So look for the handle, then use it as a tool. There, in but a few words, are encapsulated the differences between success and failure in countless situations. Recently, when a nationally known politician handled a difficult problem with creative wisdom, an opponent grudgingly admitted he took a can of worms and turned it into a gourmet dinner. Or consider Abraham Lincoln, who failed in business as a young man and had to work 17 years to pay off the debts. The first time he ran for Congress, he was beaten. When he applied for a job in the land office, he was turned down. Next, he was soundly defeated in his bid for a Senate seat. Then he lost his party's nomination for vice president, after which he again ran for the Senate and again was defeated. And yet, in the face of and in spite of these repeated failures, Abraham Lincoln did not and would not relinquish his dream, his calling, his commitment to lead his century into a new era of freedom. Great men and women are great because they possess and are possessed by great visions, great dreams, mighty purposes. The real genesis of greatness is in the inner life, the spiritual life of the man or woman stimulated and inspired by the spark of God within. When the psychologist Dr. Irene Kasorla conducted an intensive study of 20 of the most successful men in Great Britain, she concluded that without exception, these men had learned positive emotional reactions to failure. Not negative emotional responses to failing, but positive ones. Because, wrote Dr. Kasorla, each one of them held the viewpoint that in reality, failure can be seen as an integral factor in ultimate success. These 20 of the most successful men in Britain, without exception, considered failure to be a road post indicating where not to go again, or that one must blaze a new or different trail to the destination, or that one's technique of approach was ill-timed or faulty. But the key point is that these men had achieved a psychology and more than that, a philosophy, that failure was absolutely not to be considered a tragedy because it can be a preliminary element to subsequent success. See failures rather as temporary educational experiences in the Creator's eternal training program. But how then does the psychologically and spiritually healthy individual deal with the urges and appetites, the drives, temptations, and longings which he or she encounters every day? A man was on his first visit to a psychiatrist. Among the many questions the doctor asked him was, are you ever bothered by improper thoughts? The man said, no, I rather enjoy them. Through the history of human thought, there have been many philosophies advanced regarding how to control one's material urges, desires, and appetites. Human history has shown two techniques which do not work, asceticism and hedonism.
Asceticism teaches the ideal of totally denying one's physical desires as the best way of dealing with them. Hedonism teaches that the best way to deal with one's physical desires is to give in to them every time one feels an urge. And even if one doesn't feel an urge but thinks one may feel one coming on eventually to give in to it in advance. But these two all-or-nothing philosophies of coping with the appetites run counter to healthy psychology and philosophy. The ideal ought to be neither total self-gratification nor total self-denial, but rather total self-mastery, in which one is a slave neither to asceticism nor to pleasure, but is liberated through a dynamic working relationship with the indwelling divine spirit, whose wisdom and guidance are source springs of power, understanding, and joy. There was a series of psychological tests by researchers McGee and Crandall at Ohio State University, which revealed one of the most fascinating findings in contemporary psychology. It dealt with what the researchers called locus of control. In studying 900 elementary, junior, high school, and high school students, it was discovered that some students held the attitude that their lives were predominantly controlled by external circumstances. They saw themselves as having an external locus or location of control. They had come to the conclusion that they did not have much choice about how their lives went. The other group of students had what the researchers termed an internal locus of control. They held to the philosophy that the primary determination of their lives was interior, that they possessed the power to make good decisions and value judgments. The researchers discovered that the elementary, junior high, and high school students who had an internal locus of control were far more successful in problem-solving, studies, sports, and achievements in every field of endeavor. This emphasis on the internal locus of control is central to most of the great world philosophies and religions, as summarized in the statement, the kingdom of God is within you. The psychiatrist Dr. Richard Casriel, head of the Institute of Group Dynamics in New York City, teaches that one of the most important ideas for a psychologically healthy individual to have in his or her philosophy is the concept that the individual is entitled to make some mistakes. That is part of your right to learn. To expect instant and consistent perfection of oneself is to create situations which will only foster guilt and remorse, Dr. Casriel observes. Dr. Mason Hare, professor of management at MIT, writes, if you treat a subordinate as though you figured he were stupid, lazy, and untrustworthy, you are liable to develop those very traits in him. But studies in industry have shown that when a supervisor expects a great deal from an employee, the employee's motivation and productivity tend to be higher. If, on the other hand, the supervisor's expectations are too low, then the employee's productivity tends to be low, too. End of quote. Simply a reiteration of one of the oldest principles in the history of religion and philosophy. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Dr. Milton Cudney, a counseling psychologist at Western Michigan University, has found that the proverb, you are your own worst enemy, is usually profoundly true, and that such habits as constant worrying and putting off decisions are self-generated and self-defeating, and that only you yourself can conquer them. Dr. Cudney advises, take each trait one at a time. Don't try to change yourself entirely overnight. It's much easier to eliminate self-defeating attributes by starting with small, manageable pieces. The inventor Thomas Edison said that one of his own psychological secrets of effective accomplishment was that he had trained himself always to do the hardest tasks first. Each day when he arose, he turned his attention initially to the most arduous undertakings. He termed leaving the hardest tasks until last, quote, fatal. But above all, bear ever in mind that there is tremendous, untapped, spiritual power available for the daily work of your daily living, and that the infinite love of the infinite God for you as an individual can amazingly transform human life, if you will but claim it by living faith. I asked an old banker one time what the secret of success was. He said, it isn't any secret. What you have to do is jump when your opportunity comes. I said, how can you tell when your opportunity comes? He said, you can't. You just have to keep jumping. 
But that caliber of energetic alertness requires a dynamic inner psychological and spiritual life. If you honestly live in love for God and love for others, in touch with the spirit within, seeking the will and wisdom of God, questing perfection, and living by the highest of values and purposes, your life, for now and for all eternity, will be an indescribably joyous adventure of satisfying growth and genuine accomplishment. The British philosopher A. E. Orridge has written, Remember, you are a pianist, not a piano. Act. Do not merely be acted upon. Professor Dewey wrote, Only the cornered rat will think. Human beings, however, possess the faculty, if they will employ it, of thinking instead of being cornered. But really deep thinking is extraordinarily rare. It is written in the Catechism of the Maccabean Scholars. Do more than exist, live. Do more than look, observe. Do more than read, absorb. Do more than hear, listen. Do more than listen, understand. Do more than think, ponder. And do more than plan, act. The philosopher Schopenhauer wrote, Truth that has merely been learned is like an artificial limb, a false tooth, a waxen nose. It adheres to us only because it is put on. But truth acquired by thought of our own is like a natural limb. It alone truly belongs to us. This caliber of careful thinking enables the individual not merely to see things from his own perspective, but to envision the other sides of a question and thereby to avoid the philosophic error of oversimplification. Optic scientists have found that the human eye is capable of distinguishing between some two million different shades of color. The human mind is likewise capable of perceiving a vast variety of aspects to any question or problem. And the best thinkers are those who utilize the full potentials of the mind when considering a problem. The best creative thinkers are not those who restrict themselves to three or four standard solutions to problems, but who will dare to imagine innovative approaches which rely upon the human mind's ability to conjecture a wide variety of possibilities. This is a marvelously interesting world. And the most psychologically healthy individual is the one who is able to find it all marvelously interesting. For a diversity of interests is essential to balance. Dr. Lawrence S. Kuby, the psychiatrist, has described neurotic behavior as, quote, resistant to development and growth. It is rigid, inflexible, and afraid of change. Psychologically healthy behavior, by contrast, says Dr. Kuby, is flexible, growing, and eagerly learning new wisdom and understanding. What has psychology found are the most important ingredients in the living of a happy life? Scientists at the Harvard Research Center working under Dr. Patiram A. Sorokin, tested thousands of people and concluded that the single most essential prerequisite for human happiness is love. These Harvard researchers reported that self-centeredness and unhappiness go hand in hand and that love is the best cure for despondency. It was found that for children in elementary school, happiness was usually defined in terms of wish fulfillment, a new bicycle, a doll, trip to the circus, etc. But that as men and women became more mature, they began to equate happiness increasingly with personal satisfaction, love, fulfillment. In other words, with more spiritual qualities. Correlatively, it was found that, quote, unhappiness was approximately five times higher among non-religious people than among those who described themselves as, quote, very religious. Two other university studies showed that, quote, happy persons place the greatest importance on such things as peace of mind, clear conscience, friendship and affection, love of one's work, enjoyment of nature. Less happy individuals seek happiness in thrills, excitement, acquiring money, travel, new clothes, new cars, and entertainment. End of quote. Dr. James McDermott, clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington, says his studies indicate that the principle it is more blessed to give than to receive is literally true. I quote him, free-hearted, generous giving is a prescription I'd recommend for any man or woman who'd like to live a healthier, happier life. He says people whose greatest interest is in getting tend to use most of their energies in acquiring, which creates what the professor calls a demanding attitude, which often triggers a negative response from those around you. When you focus on receiving, you're often turned down and often disappointed. But when you're giving to somebody, you're thinking of them instead of yourself. It's almost always healthier to concentrate on the people around you than to adopt a self-centered attitude that results when you're only thinking of getting for yourself, end of quote. 
and psychiatrist Dr. Carl Menninger wrote, Love Cures People, both the ones who give it and the ones who receive it. And 2,000 years ago, the Galilean taught that the two great commandments of human life are centered on the giving of love. You shall love the Lord your God, he taught with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Swiss psychiatrist Dr. Carl Jung stated that he had never known of a patient over the age of 35 to recover from a deep psychological emotional problem without the help of and the development of a religious philosophy of life. It is this spiritual empowerment derived from the transcendent universe of meanings and values that energizes the most vibrant and alive personalities. One eminent psychiatrist, Dr. James T. Fisher, wrote in his work, The Casebook of a Psychiatrist, that if everything modern psychiatry had learned about healthy psychological attitudes were to be summarized and abbreviated, it would be nothing but an awkward and incomplete version of Jesus of Nazareth's Sermon on the Mount. At MIT, a series of studies have shown that a person who does not like himself or herself will be less tolerant and loving of other people. And conversely, the individual who values and respects himself can all the better value and respect others. Because in order to love your neighbor as yourself, the logical precondition is that one must, in the healthiest sense, love oneself. There must be normal self-respect and a sense of one's own spiritual self-value. The psychologist Dr. Eric Fromm has said the most important experience in life is love, and that the finest part of love is friendship. Dr. Sigmund Freud, as a result of his clinical studies, described the two essential aspects of psychological health to be Leben and Arbeiten, love and work. There must be outgoing affection, as well as the enjoyment of the tasks of life. Psychologist Bernard S. Robbins studied those individuals who say they detest working and found that such feelings nearly always are symptoms of serious neurosis. The psychologically normal individual, Dr. Robbins found, should derive three positive feelings from work. One, a feeling of usefulness. Two, self-confidence. And three, satisfaction. The value of inspiring philosophical and spiritual beliefs and practices is no longer mere hypothesis. It is proven fact. One careful national survey conducted by psychologists and sociologists even showed overwhelmingly that religious women had better sex lives than non-religious women. Subsequent polls and studies have reconfirmed the original report. The American Medical Association has released studies revealing that people who regularly attended religious worship services have lower blood pressure and fewer heart problems than the rest of the population as a whole. Psychological studies published in the respected Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion by Professor Raymond G. Carey show that using accepted mood and attitude measurement scales, men and women who engage in the daily practices of prayer or worship are measurably statistically happier and more cheerful in their average moods and attitudes than those who do not pray or worship. The fascinating fact is that doctors are finding a positive psychological attitude and a positive philosophy and religion are remarkably interlinked. Therefore, in summation, the lifestyle of any individual will be tremendously strengthened by the inclusion of vital philosophic and spiritual practices. Anyone can bend a plain iron rod. But if that iron be melted down and only 2% carbon stirred in, the result would be steel, both stronger and tremendously tougher than plain iron. Only 2% will make that difference. In every 24-hour day, there are exactly 1,440 minutes. And 2% of that is about 29 minutes. Any individual who will take as little as 2% of his or her day for higher philosophic thought and spiritual practices for prayer, meditation, and worship will become a personality of power and purpose astonishingly greater than before. Just as 2% of carbon makes the difference between soft iron and strong steel, 29 minutes a day for the philosophic and spiritual life can be the factor which transmutes a merely adequate person into a more far-sighted, decisive, vigorous, and joyful focal point of power and of progress. It does require initial efforts to change your habit patterns and learn the sorts of practices and priorities which I have been teaching. But as Alfred P. Sloan once put it, when you're through changing, you're through. 
And there is a great exhilaration in the processes of personal growth, for endless spiritual growth is the eternal adventure of eternal life, beginning here and now for those who will claim it by faith.